You are here on purpose with a purpose by design. Oh, Lillian, I'm so glad you're here. Now, I know you quite well, but a lot of our viewers and listeners don't. So first question, tell us, Lillian, who are you? Well, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Lillian Okesh. I help women who lost hope to let them know that hard work with dedication, success is possible, and they can design their new life. And the result of that, they can live with confidence, knowing that it doesn't matter where they come from, they can make it in life. So to go back to who am I, I always tell people, I say, God sent me through South Sudan. I landed in Uganda and I find myself in America. <laughs> oh my gosh, you're a world traveler, aren't you? Yes. <laughs> That's amazing. Now, did I stop? Did I interrupt you too soon? Was there anything else about you, who you are you were going to tell us or were you finished? No, I'm oh, finished. Okay. okay, all right. So um, all of these incredible authors, ladies and gentlemen, really are little protégés so to say, of the legendary Les Brown. All of these authors have been trained by him, including myself. We went through the Power Voice system. Some call it the Power Voice Academy, where we were taught for weeks by the legendary Les Brown. Months, really, months adding into weeks, weeks adding into months. Six Lillian, weeks. you're one of those ladies. Yes, yes. Tell us how did you end up connected with the legendary Les Brown? What's that all about? So how did I get connected to, with Mr. Brown? I call him Uncle Les. I call myself as John in the Bible. When God tell him to go to Nineveh, he decided to go to a different town. Um, because I been follow Les actually for a long time, and I believe uh, Les Brown is the one who saved my life because I was in abusive relationship that I get pregnant when I was sixteen because of my culture they have to marry me off for this man, and he was older than me, so the relationship was just really bad. And one day I don't know how I come across Les Brown. A video he was talking about some people they are living together or dying together and I found myself I was dying with this man and you know because I come in this country I I live in project house you know when we, when you come in this country they give you like food stuff and stuff so I really don't know anything about about how to make it on my own because when you when you come here the government will take care of you and because we live in a in a community mm -hmm. where people rely on government so i don't know like when les brown was talking about you are enough you know you can make it like his story kind of connected with me and i'm like whatever he's saying it sounds like it's from a different part of the world but whatever it is it it, it was waking me up you know so when he says some people are living together or dying together, I say, oh, no, I'm dying with this man and I have to get out. You know, I have to get out of my relationship. So I was in that relationship for 10 years. And by the time I decided to get out, I already have four boys. I have no career. I have I was working at Walmart. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. I'm just like it it doesn't matter. I'm just going to get out. So I remember finding myself with my four boys living in my mom two bedroom apartment. We are all sleeping in the living room because we don't have enough room. Um from there because mm -hmm. of like the life pressure I start taking like ibuprofen mm -hmm. and like painkiller because for somehow I was in depression. I just want to, I just want the pain to go away. But I didn't know that I was overdosing myself to sleep because when you overdose yourself, you know, you don't feel anything. Mm -hmm. Like you feel weak, but at least you can sleep. And, but even though I was doing that, like I was overdosing myself to sleep, I will still get up in the morning and listen to Les Brown and listen to Jim Rohn. 
So on my last anthology book, for such a time as this, I actually mentioned that I feel like those two, the ones saved my life because even though I was in such a pain where I don't know where to go, I still continue listening to them. And finally, I come to my scent. I need to make a change. And that when I start my cleaning business and I find a, a place to live, I find a small town home to live and one day I was sitting there, that was in 20, 2020, on October. I was sitting there. The place, the place wasn't bad, but there was like cockroaches everywhere. Like cockroaches can climb on the wall on the daytime. Okay, that's how bad the place was. So I was crying out to God. I'm like, God, I just need help. I want to get out of here. I want to find a good place for my kid. I want my business to grow. What would I do? But God was waiting for me to make the move. So I've been following the power voice for a quite like about a couple months, but I never take the time to like I sign up. And there was one day Les Brown they post the video about him dancing. I thought that was funny. Okay. <laughs> I was just crawling down the Facebook. I see him dancing and I'm like, oh Uncle Les, <laughs> he can dance. I just laugh about it and I put my phone away. But that night I couldn't sleep. The video keep playing in my mind. And I say, what is this? I get up at 11 at night. I, I, can't, I can't go to bed. I was so tired, but I can't go to bed. I say, I don't know what is it, but I just don't know what is it. Like, But God was telling me, like, sign up to the power voice. But I keep ignoring it. And the picture clearly come on my face. And I hear a clear voice saying, is this all you see? Uncle Les dancing, is that all you see? So I'm like, oh, okay, you got me, you know? So I get up right there. I message the team. They get back to me right away, but I did not sign up right away. It took me two days because I was still crying out to God <laughs> to see if he was, if this is what he wanted for me, okay? So it took me another two days. I finally agreed to sign up. And that's how I become the student and certificate graduate from Les Brown academy wow <laughs> yes that's just amazing so you end up on american soil yes and you're here with someone that you're dying with yes and you don't know what to do like you're depressed you feel stuck like you have these children and it's at that time that Mr. Brown appears literally in, in front of your face because you're on your phone. Yes. And says that statement, you're living or dying with the person you're with. Mm -hmm. And you have an aha moment. And right. Realize my life needs to change. And so you get out of that situation, but then begin to self-medicate so that yes. you can just push out all the noise, right? All the pain. Yes. And yet again, here comes Mr. Brown marching across your path, mm -hmm. showing you joy instead of pain. You know, mourning for dancing, right? Dancing for mourning. There he is dancing, showing you the other side. Yes, yes. I you on the other side. Oh my gosh. That is so powerful, Lillian. And I saved that video, but I think they removed it out of Facebook. But that was my haha -ha moment. And I crazy that video. Like, if I ever have a chance to talk with Les Brown, I would say, can I just get that video? Because every time when I feel like I'm not making progress, Mm -hmm. I watched that video. I say, you remember that video that wake you up at the middle of the night? So it will say, yep, let's keep going. Let's keep going. Wow. Yes. Oh, my goodness. That is just a testimony in and of itself. Like how you ended up here in on American soil, how you ended up walking away from that, obviously a disastrous relationship, but you also said that you started your own business. So you got out of where you were working, where it really wasn't going anywhere. 
and you end up with your own business. Like, that's amazing, Lillian, right there. And that's not where it ends. This is just the beginning of your story. <laughs> this is <laughs> the beginning, beginning because, you know, I just want to go back a little bit and tell people I was born in refugees camp. Okay. Mm -hmm. I born in refugees camp. I born under the tree where there was no blanket to greet me in this world. And mm -hmm. there was not any good food. Um, my family were living under the tent because when you arrived to refugees camp, that was the gift you. So, but when I was living, since I was a kid, my mom, my, our refugees camp was so good because they give, they give like a land, like maybe a half of acre for every family to live in. And so you can plan your own food and build your own house. So my mom, she was a single mother of eight kids before she married my stepfather. So my mom, when we was a young, when we, when we was a kid, my mom on Sunday, she will get us all together. We will worship before she left for the garden. Hmm. So that how I become, uh, so from there, my mom will, you know, we will sing, we will pray. And then she will say, because she's a single mother, she have to work in order for us to have food. But when mom left to the garden, I will be left at home to take care of my little sister. And from there, you know, when my sister, they're playing because we live in a village where we just play outside and all the kids are just taking care of themselves. So I was a little bit old. So when mom is not home here, my, my sister, they play. I always, I'm, I was a quiet child. I was, I don't talk much. I always just sit alone under the tree or just admire the beauty of the world. I always just sit there and I'm like, I will recall back what mom was praying about, how good God is, how big God is, how awesome God is. But, and then I don't have a shoes to wear. I only wa have one pair of clothes. <laughs> You know, that we will wash at night, hanging, we will wash it at night, hang it up to dry in the morning, we put it on. So one pair of clothes. In my mind, I'm just like, okay, if God is this great, if God is this big, why are we living so small? Why we don't even, sometimes we don't even have food to eat. And, you know, in January, in Uganda, it's really hot. So we have to... You probably don't know this, but we have to cut like banana, like banana peels, and then we will make it into shoes so we can walk on it because the ground is so hot. You can walk on it with your bare feet. So when we're doing that, mom prayer always get in my mind. I'm like, if God is this big, then why do we suffer? Why can he just provide us with the shoes? I just need the shoes because I don't want my feet to get burned. So coming from that kind of environment and learning here in this country. I remember when we arrived in New York City, we arrived here in January. January in Africa is really hot, but in America it's cold. We were wearing a summer clothes with a slipper. We didn't know. Our caseworker didn't tell us, well, even though they tell us we did not have money to buy the jacket to wear to come to America. So we arrived with a short skirt, with a t-shirt, it was freezing cold. While I was sitting in that um, in that airport, I was sitting like this. I was so cold, <clears throat> but my mind opened. Seeing all those women, you know, they carry their luggage, they carry their business bag. They are walking in a high heel, going up and down, wearing those nice shoes. Their hair was flowing. I was just sitting there as a young girl, mm -hmm. like, wow. I don't know where all those women going, but one day I will be just like them. So right then, right there, I know God has bring me in this country. And I don't take coming to America lightly because I believe from all the things that I've gone through, God has saved me here yeah. for a reason. Yes. And I have to do everything I can to make sure I die empty. I do not want cemetery to take wow. any of my treasure none so that's why i'm here with you pamela because i give up my life for god to use me fully oh that's really touching it's so powerful 
Can I circle back to a couple of questions from what you just shared? Would that be okay? Yeah. So you said you were living at a refugee camp and you said when you first arrived or when your mom arrived and it sounded like you, you weren't born yet or you were born shortly thereafter. Is that correct? Yes. So my mom was pregnant with me when they were fleeing with South Sudan. Okay. So wow. that way is so... I feel so blessed because you have to remember there was a war in South Sudan yeah. and people were having anxiety. They were having attack. And some people, I'm, I know this is sound really sad, and uh, but some people were climbing mm -hmm. over dead body, you know, so they can find safety. Sure. And some mother, because of the anxiety, they lost their babies wow. while they were pregnant, but I didn't. Like God saved me. So when they arrived in, in Uganda, that way I was born. But all this time she was running, she, they, she had no water to drink, she had no food to eat. God was taking care of me. So that way, you know, like I, I felt blessed to be in this country. And I, I praise my mom so much for all the pain that she go through to make sure I am here. No kidding. What an incredible mom you have to fight her way through all of that. Now, yes. when, when you first, as a family, were in that refugee camp, did you say that the only thing that they gave you was a tent? Is that what you said? Or you lived in a tent? Could you repeat that? Yeah, they will. So, <laughs> so when you arrive in refugee camp, the first thing they will give you is a tent, and if you're lucky, you can get some blanket. Um, but and then you know they will write all of you guys' name, your family name, and then they will start giving food. But that food is not even enough because maybe they will give you about, I could say maybe about. 10 pound or 20 pound for every family. So if you have a lost family, that is really not enough for the whole month. Sure. So, so yeah. So when you arrive in refugee camp, they give us a tent mm -hmm. and food mm -hmm. and that's it. The rest of the thing, you have to figure it out. Okay. So tell us about the food because people in America, you know, we can get food at every grocery store, all kinds. And there's many restaurants. Um, there are people that experience hunger in America. Uh, that is definitely for sure. But as a general rule, when you think about uh, America, you think of it as a land of plenty, right? So when you say they gave you food for those people that might be thinking, you know, um, you know, what is that called when they deliver the food right to your door? You know, <laughs> and just, you just call up Uber or whatever and and they bring you your food. We're not talking about them delivering McDonald's or, or pizza. What what was your food that your family would have been given that to try to make last? And you had, it sounds like you came from a large family. So how much did they give you? And what were you said? Up to 20 pounds, but of what? So they will okay. give you beans. Beans is about probably 20 pounds of beans and probably about 25 pounds of corn. And sometimes they give you like a bottle of oil mm -hmm. and that's it. So when they give you those food, like beans, corn, or rice, and oil. So you have to figure out where to find your onion. You have to figure out where to find your salt. You have to figure out, you know, some, some family, they run without a pot to cook those things even. So mm -hmm. now... Some people, <laughs> when they were living in refugee camp, when this when this family finished cooking, they will eat, and then this person can borrow that, their pot, sure, and go cook. So that when you ask that question, I always laugh when people say I'm starving mm -hmm. when they're in America. <laughs> when they just, like they just ate breakfast two hours ago. Right. So when it's time for lunch, they say, I'm starving. I just look at them. You know, when I used to work at Walmart, that all, I hear that a lot. And I just look at them. I'm like, what do you mean you're starving? You just eat like two hours. Do you even know the meaning of starving? Like, right. 
because I live in a place where you go for the whole day with no food and maybe get something small to eat at night when you get when your family is lucky. If not, you have to sleep hungry and try your best to find something to eat the next days. That is starving. Okay, so yeah, for me, I like I have to learn when I come in this country after because it was like so much food. And sometimes people don't realize that uh, because you come from where there was no food, you can you can become like um, food addicted kind of thing. Like we have a problem in, in our community, like people can just eat it, even though they are full, they will still keep eating because of what they went through the, the past. Their brain thinks that the food will run out, but you're in America, you know, the food will not run out. So I have to like, slowly train my brain out of that like there is always food so i don't have to worry about that sure. and so yeah so when um when like right now you can just sit in your in your house in america and you can just order like hoover take take out hoover and most of our food we buy we, buy, we will buy food but 20 percent, even 40 percent of our food go in the garbage you know, in America here, and we don't know how much like it will mean to some people in Africa. And I was just there in August of this year. You know, the, the Africa really didn't change much. And for me, because God has given me a vision of when I see things, it always touch my heart. So when I was going through the village from the village and seeing all the suffering, and I'm just like. I just want to do something and it's, it's just heartbroken. Like I even stopped eating in some point when I was in Africa, because I'm just like, you know, I have the money because, you know, I'm from here, I can get the food, but I saw the people like they will sit there with their corn on the market all day. And um, if, if, if nobody bought their corn, I mean, if nobody buy their corn or buy whatever they're selling, so that means they will have no food that day for their family. Or, you know, they like if they're selling clothes, if nobody buy their clothes, then they will have no money to buy food for their family. And that is some 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 of the suffering in the other side of the world that we are in America. We should be so lucky and so blessed to do everything that we can to live the best life that we could because we live in the land of opportunity. So yeah, that's a big difference there. <laughs> that's a huge difference there. And just even what you pointed out, living in a tent, and I know you said that that the place that you lived was generous in the fact that they would give land that you could build your own home. Did, did you guys hear that? They didn't talk about hiring a contractor, right? Bringing out the construction team. They're going to come out and lay the foundation tomorrow. No, build your own home. So then that was dependent upon how qualified you were and what you could build. And then I imagine they weren't bringing you the resources like, okay, here's your lumber. You would need to figure all of that out or live in a tent. Either way, we're not talking about having a deluxe kitchen. Uh -uh. We're talking about people sharing a pot and then it's like, okay, where, what did they use? How did they use that pot? Where did they, could, there wasn't a stove. We're talking like over building a fire or something, right? Yep. You have to go in a, in a forest, get a dry, a dry tree cut it down i'm so happy because my my book is coming in may of next year so all these things will be in the books amazing <laughs> so we you 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 know when you're cooking of course you have no stove you have no water even first of all you have to look for water you have to look for food you have to look for the wood to cook the food so and then we have they have three rocks uh, you put these three rocks there and then you put your wood and you make a fire and so those three rocks i don't know if you i don't know if you read the book it's called the root um i think oh hold on sorry you're fine 
this is actually the book right here it's called the ruth oh yes yes okay mm -hmm. yeah so if like the way they describe it over there so you have to put three rocks and then put those wood in there and make a fire and that's how we cook so that way for me even when pandemic hit i did not panic I, like i don't panic because where i grow up uh we learn how to live in a small amount of things so even me with my kid if i'm having a hard time like buying food whatever we have in the house i'll figure out a way to make it work sure so those are the life skills that i have learned it sounds it sounds bad like you know we don't have all this fancy stuff but we learn uh, a lifetime life skill that no matter what happened in the world i don't panic like when the pandemic come and all that i don't panic because i went through the worst so nothing really uh come as a storm for me like oh well <laughs> amazing amazing so from living in the refugee camp which i just love the fact that we're shining light on this because people can don't have an understanding of what that means oh well, refugee camp they have a nice place they have food no this three stones that you went and found for yourself that you'd have to figure a way to you know to make sure that you could heat it up with the ground wasn't hot enough or whatever banana peels on your feet for shoes living in a tent and you know as you're talking about the pandemic i'm thinking about all the people that went in and began to go crazy buying toilet paper remember the toilet paper shortage yeah yes and, you know really toilet paper shortage okay let me ask you this question how many rolls of toilet paper did they give to you when you went to the refugee camp i imagine they weren't handing out packages of tp here's your toilet paper to keep you for the next month am i right well first of all there was even no bathroom <laughs> i knew you were gonna go there so, so so there was even no bathroom so you like people have to figure out a way the thing about living in refugees camp is it's undes it's undescribable undescribable moment for people because when when people never experience that like when they hear you talking they're like what are you talking about because here you are you lost your home you lost everything you have sometimes you even lost your family member running for your life coming in this country you don't know the language you don't know the culture you don't know how they live then you have to figure out a way like how do these people live where do they get their wood to, uh, to cook from oh you know where do they get their water what can can i do to survive it's like there's some show on like tv like there's a survivor survivor or something like that where people go in a while and that is sometimes how it feel because you're in this new country you don't know what it is you just have to figure out a way and that way when people come in america uh america sometimes destroy the refugees or sometimes it build them because it's a completely new life that you have to try to figure out like what am i to do here you can either be successful or this life can destroy you because then you have all this thing you don't know what to do with it and some people because of the trauma they went through even though they're in this great land because of their past they can't see the good thing that they have in front of them you know so true, so true. which is why now coming into a totally different viewpoint or vantage point that i have of you you said in the beginning of our interview that you're here to give hope especially to women to help them find their purpose and destiny and to get out to, to get out of their past and leave it behind now everybody that's listening and watching doesn't this come into view because uh, lillian's been there done that bought the t-shirt she knows what it's like from the refugee camp into america but now yes the man the land of opportunity but here you are 
in a land of opportunity you don't know anything about. You don't know anything about uh -huh. and having to navigate that terrain. So you end up in Des Moines, far from that camp, living in an apartment or a home, house, whatever. And so now a stove, refrigerator, a bathroom, a toilet, woo toilet paper, but you're dying. Yes, yes. Coming to America and starting a new life. Mm -hmm. For me, when I come here, I was 15 years old. You I were didn't, 15, you were 15. I didn't, I didn't speak any English. So they put me in the ninth grade because America, they go by the age. They don't go like by what you know. So now here I am in ninth grade, learning my ABC, something that people should learn in preschool. But I have a great teacher. Her name is her name is Nina Lon. She was from Ukraine. She her her job is pretty much to help refugees learn English and learn how to read, to write, so they can, you know, get a good life in this country. And here I am, new country, new life, <laughs> where there is a bathroom. Like everything is inside. And you'll be like, wow, is America sound like heaven when you're not here? <laughs> sure. You know, the way they say it. But just like I told you, since I come here, I know that there have to be a reason for all the things that I went through. Some of my story I didn't even tell you because there's something they call fist disease, which now they find out is skin cancer. When I was one years old, I have it on my right arms. So this is how high I can raise. I can raise my right arm. I cannot raise higher than that. Like I can do this one fine, but this is like you know. So when I come in this country, they pretty much think like they put me as a disability person. But I'm like no, because I can work. Like but when I carry a lot of heavy thing, I get the pain. But that disease when we were in refugee camp, it killed a lot of people, the people who even were older than me, adults. But I was one years old. I survived that. Wow. You know, so, and then when I was nine years old, because of the poor environment of living, I actually was a dead person, uh, Pamela. I was, I, I was dead. Like, I remember, you know, like, I don't know if you've been dead before, but it's like, darkness will come over you mm -hmm. and i remember my mom my, i i can hear my old body was gone but i still can hear because hearing pretty much the last thing left you oh. yeah i hear my mom my mom was calling my brother and 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 asking my brother to go call my grandma because i will not make it that night but my mom did something when she tell my brother to go call my grandma she asked god she said god at that time i was nine years old she said god if you don't want her to be with me why did you let her suffer this long because i always like been sick i always have a like a bad health since i was born and i've been suffer sin and she said, why? And from right then, right there, I don't know who God is. I don't know what is it about God. I even myself with the last breath I have, I asked God to, I say, yes, God, why? As soon as I ask God that, I feel the lift. I see the light. The darkness start leaving me. I come back to life. <laughs> and... I make it, I'm here. So when I look through all those and now I'm here, why would I be wasting my breath even just for one second? Come on. Why would I be wasting my breath? So mm -hmm. I thank God every day and I will do everything I can to glorify his kingdom. Which is why Mr. Brown was sent to you. Yes. Because you had made that decision in your heart. And God was not going to sit there and let depression or anything else snuff out the light that's in you, the story that's in you, 
and the power voice that's in you. Absolutely. Oh my gosh. Okay, so you join power voice. You go through the power voice system. What happened to you in that time? I'm sure there's a transformation story. Tell us a little bit about that. Take us from power voice all the way to anthology, like to the anthology, maybe not through the whole book, but take us on a little road trip from power voice to present. I joined, I finally mm -hmm. take a courage and join power voice. That was my life change moment. I always believe that I have a voice, but I don't know how to express it. I don't know how to share my story. So that's why I feel the calling that because when I joined Power Voice, I already started my cleaning company. And the reason why I started my cleaning company is because I look around my community. The people who are here, the refugees who are here, I look around. I'm looking for help. I cannot find that help. And I sit down, I said, if I don't do it for my people, who will? Wow. Right then, right there, that when I start cleaning for hope. And that cleaning for hope led me to Les Brown because I was hungry. I was hungry for greatness. I was hungry. I want to help people. I want to help young girls out there. I want to help young men out there. Let them know that you are now in this country. You can make a difference. You can do it. It doesn't matter what you've been through. And so when I joined the Power Voice, I remember, I, I remember asking John, because, you know, John was thinking in the result of working with Les. And short after joining Power Voice, I joined uh, thinking into result with John. So he, John was working in my mind, in my thinking. Yes. The good book say, as a man thinks, so is he. So whether you're, even though you live in a great country, if you're thinking is it is 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 not great, you will not make it. You have to work in your thinking. Right. So I remember asking John, I said, John, I want to share my story with Les. You know how John talks. He's like, okay, Lily. I'm like, okay, John. <laughs> you know, like, like every time when I just ask him, he's just like, okay, Lily, okay, Lily. I'm like, oh, John, just say something else beside that. But um... <laughs> you sounded like him when you said <laughs> I sounded just like him. <laughs> so I remember he said, okay, Lily, you're going to share your story tonight with Les Brown. I get freaked out. And I said, no, I cannot do that. <laughs> he said, well, you asked me, but he gave me some time. He know that I was not ready. He gave me like two weeks and then he said, okay, you ready? And when they call my name, I really want to share my story with Les Brown. But I think they give us like three minutes. I only take two minutes like i i didn't even take two minutes maybe one minute and a half and i was like shaking because here i am speaking with les brown right and les brown take the small piece that i have he put it together into this beautiful story it's like it's like it's like les brown was taking me from the place where i was locked in and just peeling out all um like peeling out all those things that was covering me like unlock all the change that was blocking me from moving forward here let's bring transforming my life into beautiful this lillian and at the end he said queen lillian i said oh my god <laughs> Uncle, let's call me queen. <laughs> but that that was the beginning, you know. That was the beginning. I signed in. I signed on October. This year in March, we have the Women of Power Voice, and 
it, it just life has been up and, and on and on. And I finally move out my three bedroom apartment. I'm in town home. I get my own place with the boys. Glory be to God. Yes. <laughs> you know, and only by God grace. If you say yes, you have to say yes and believe. Have the faith and know that it will work out. If you have that faith and you say yes, thing did not just happen to me. I say yes to get myself out of the pain I was. I say no to overdose myself to sleep because that could have led me in a different direction. Yeah. But I said, no, I have my boys. I don't want them to see me as addicted mother. I want mm -hmm. the best for them. So I have to listen to Uncle Les for all the things that he taught me that I can do it. If he was called mental retarded when he was a kid, now he helping people. Why not me? Why not me? Because when I come in this country, when I was in high school, people, I did not speak in any English. And young people were like the kid in my class, they were making fun of me, calling me monkey. You know, you don't speak English. Uh, what are you saying? And all that. And I was like heartbroken. So by last, like when he shared his story, People were calling him mental retarded when he was young. We get connected. I'm like, that's what they used to call me. They used to call me like, you know, monkey. But now I can't share my story. They used to call him like mental retarded. Now he's sharing his story. Why not me? You know, so that's how I come. Because I listened to Lisa Nichol, Tony Robert. I could have gone with any of those big names but there was nothing connected me with them, but something connected me with Les Brown. And for all that he went through when he was a kid, I feel the pain that he went through. And I went through a lot when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. So now seeing him up there, I say, okay, I wanna get that baton that you're passing on. I wanna get some and go pass it on to somebody else. <laughs> you know so from there really like right now i joined power voice 2000 2021 on october we are now in december of 2021 so it's about a year and it's about a year and two months i'm an author i'm international bestseller <laughs> And I am a second time Amazon bestseller. Second time? Second time. And, and I started a school in Africa. I help young girls. I, I, I reached back to my community. I said, you know, because when I went back there, I see the way people were suffering. I said, I have to do something. So I started that organization to reach my hand out and help. And now here I am helping people here, helping women here. And just because I say yes on the night where I say Uncle Les was dancing. <laughs> when Uncle Les was showing you dancing. Yes. For your sorrows. He yes. was showing you how to dance right out of that. He was really shining the light on, on today. Like yes. what was going to be happening in a year or so down the road that you couldn't quite see it with your eyes, but you could grab a hold of it and conceive it by faith, little by little, a faith walk. So this is so amazing. Take a giant step for us from, from Power Voice to the anthology. And, and obviously... Sharing your story in a written way is so powerful and so needed because your story and your voice are amazing and they're needed. There's lives hanging in the balance. How did this happen for you? That you are completed power voice, you have your business, you're living your life, and now all of a sudden this opportunity is brought to you. Share just briefly on that. How did you land in the anthology? And 
be here today. This is amazing. Go ahead. I'm so excited. I can't wait. Tell us how this happened. <laughs> well, first of all, I want to say thank you to you because you hear God's voice. Because mm-hmm. God has given you this vision and you say, yes, Lord, your servant is listen. Yes, Lord. And because you listen, now you cannot fulfill your vision by yourself. You need all this sister to fulfill it with you. And Yashika come in and you guys agree. And when Yashika sent the message out, I think I said this before, I was in South Sudan. I was in a village. The place where I was, there was no network. I'm just, for me, that is amazing. That is a real testimony because if yeah. your time is now, it doesn't matter whether you, <laughs> you're in a place where there's a no network, you will get a signal out of nowhere. <laughs> That's right. I get a signal out of nowhere seeing Yashika, uh, Yashika message. I was sleeping in the place where there was no electric there's no electrician in that um in that village my phone i think my phone was 20 percent left it was gonna die off (laughs) and i see the message and that how i know when i get back to us thing like the financial actually was really tight with me because i just get back but i'm like there had to be a reason for me to see this message when I was way in the village. <laughs> right. And I have to be a part of this book. It, it sounds amazing. The good thing that I always thank God is when he speaks, I listen. And that's the thing that I want to tell people sometimes. And you can read that on my chapter that I said on the first line, whether you are ready or not, when God speak, you listen. Otherwise, you will miss out your blessing. Because the world we're living right now, we have technology, we have yeah. we, we we have children, we have school, we have this COVID problem. We have we didn't we don't have time to listen to God. We don't have this time. And God's voice is so small. If you're not careful, you will miss it. Boom. Oh. Yep. Wow. So I learned to listen to him. And when I joined the woman of Paul voice, I just know that this book will change my life for good. And I have to do it. Wow. I still have this vision. I don't know why, but for somehow I... I need to write this down. For some, I know that I will work with less in the future. I don't know how, but I see this vision of changing the world, helping people with my voice. And God has given me the voice to speak and I can keep silent. I have to share my story with the world. Maybe my story will change the other person. And that how in in my chapter is pretty much to encourage people that letting them know that it doesn't matter where they come from, especially for women. You don't need anybody to tell you they have to be in your life in order for you to make it. Yeah. You already <laughs> ordained and wonderfully made and sent in this world to accomplish something. And you can do it. You and God alone. You just have to go deep inside and find that person who is missing inside of you. Let that lion round in you. So you can fly like an eagle. You have to leave the chicken out and find your eagle friend. Whether you're a young eagle or you're already flying, you have to find your ego friends so they can help you fly higher and higher. Because when you start this journey, the storm will hit you. But the beautiful thing about ego, when the storm hit, they can fly through the storm so they can go above the storm. Yes, they can fly. So that's what you need to do. 
in life. And that's what I did. That's why I'm here today sharing my voice, sharing my story. Even though I will not be here someday, the women of Parvos Anthology will always be there. Always be there. Yes. Okay, well, I wasn't expecting to get all emotional tonight, but <laughs> <laughs> praise God. Praise God for you and for your leadership, for your strength and for your vision because when god spoke to me about this anthology it was for you lillian for all of the women yes. tonight i'm speaking to you it was for you he had you in mind he was looking at you seeing your life and your story and all of the lives that your life has touched and are yet to touch that's right Oh my goodness, goodness, goodness. Wow. And yes, it's a legacy we can leave for our children and our children's children and their children and their children and on yes. and on and on, right? Yes. And all of those that are super, are supernatural or spiritual children are offspring to us. Absolutely. We'll be there for them. So with that being said, how do people reach out to you and get this book? Get an autographed copy. How do they connect with you to hear more about your story or help you fulfill your vision? Tell us, tell us. You can go to my website. On my website, I have, you go to lilianokesh.com. It's L-I-L-I-A-N-O-K-E-C-H.com. So on my website, I have my story. I have my outreach organization. I have my book there you can buy or you can sign a lesson with me, just chat. And I'm so excited. Pretty soon I will launch my course to teach people how to build their mission statement. Oh, wow. That is exciting. Yes. So because mission statement, the one helped me to find my voice. Yes. And I want to help people to build their mission statement so they can live in a clear mm -hmm. view, of, view of life, mm -hmm. knowing that they have a reason for getting up in the morning. They have a reason to go to work. They have a reason to do what they do. Right. And all this because I say yes to join. The power voice. <laughs> I'm so glad you said yes. You know, because I say yes. And or you can find me on Facebook at Lilian Okesh. That can, I mean at Lilian Okesh on my Facebook page or Instagram. Um yes. And if you want to help the people in South Sudan, really, because my vision in South Sudan is to help young girl and young men build their confidence and help them with technology. That's what we're doing because some people, they finish university in South Sudan, they still don't know how to use technology. Mm -hmm. And I'm going back there in February. So if you have an old computer or you want to donate a computer or you just want to donate money to pay for somebody's school fee uh, so they can take those training, is all welcome and you can you can find all that on my website so i'm here to serve the humanity and if you listen to me you're there to help me fulfill what the universe has sent me here to do so you can find all that on my website and let's chat from there let's make this world a beautiful place for me i feel like if one person can get up and do one thing, one good thing in this world, we will leave the world a much better place than it is right now. Amen. Mm -hmm. Lillian, thank you for sharing the depths of your soul and your story tonight and how you're paying it forward in so many ways. Yes. Thank you. And all of that that she shared, 
how to reach out to her and all of that, how to get the book from her, how to help support the schools in, in, in Sudan, please just look in the description. It's all there. Yes. So her website, all that stuff, it's all there. You can yeah. follow up with her. Again, I say thank you, Lillian. It's been a, just, I'm without words, which doesn't happen very often. <laughs> <laughs> um, a treasure, a treasure. I treasure this time. Thank you. You're welcome. And thank you all for being here. Now do me a big favor. As Les always says, like it and share it. This story needs to go all over the world. Will you help take Lillian's story and her power voice all over the world? Like it and share it. Comment, 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 share it. Let's empower Lillian to empower the world that she is being sent into. Thank you so much. You have a purpose by design, not by default, just like Lillian. And it can't be denied. So go on out there and be the salt and the light everywhere you go. Pamela Hinkle is the founder of The Purpose Center. Pamela is a mindset mentor, author, speaker, minister, and transformation coach. Her weekly podcast, international radio show, and television show are a lifeline that changes lives and inspires people to discover their individual potential through realizing their purpose by design. Pamela is a natural motivator and has shown many how to find their niche and transform their lives. Although success is an uphill battle, Pamela gives the necessary strategies to flourish, cheering you on every step of the way. Pamela shares from her personal experiences, education, and life as a woman in leadership, utilizing decades of knowledge, taking the approach of, let's have coffee and chat. She will awaken your dreams and purpose by design. Are you ready for Pamela to help guide you? Email us at purposewpamela.office at gmail.com or go to her website at purposewithpamela.com.